to see women taking on that that role, they feel demas- emasculated, right? Like as if that they um, <laughs> that they are they're losing a piece of themselves in some sense, right? Which isn't, you know, I think that we need to uh, remind folks that that's that's not what this is about. You know, you're not going to be less of a man because I'm shooting a moose. Welcome back to Radical Narrative Season 3. I am your host, Mylon Tatusis. We just realized last week that we had a birthday. Radical Narrative is now one year old. So we've been doing this for one whole year. Be sure you go back and listen to those episodes if you haven't listened to them. And again, we're constantly growing, constantly expanding, constantly open into new guests and new conversations. So be sure to stay tuned and listen in as we continue to grow. Thank you for all your support for our avid listeners and supporters. And if you are just now tuning in to Radical Narrative, welcome to the Radical Narrative family. Find us on social media, on Instagram and Facebook. Like and subscribe to our podcast wherever you get podcasts and share it with your family. Share it with the people you love because we have some really good conversations on this podcast. There's a lot of brain gains, a lot of awarenesses that people go through, and we love to hear about that. Back to business. This is episode two, and for today, I'm bringing to you Terry Sungeon's. Terry Sunjin is going to have a conversation about some things she normally does not get to talk about in her regular job as a PhD student and as an Indigenous Initiatives Coordinator at McEwen University. The reality with Terry is that she is also an avid moose hunter and has a long history of being a professional target shooter. She has been shooting since she was a child. Listen in as we talk about how she became an avid hunter and shooter, what it's like being a woman who actively fills the freezer with wild game, and what she wants young female, LGBTQT, and male hunters to know. So be sure to stay tuned and listen in. Great. Yeah, I've been wanting to get you on this podcast for a few months now. We've been talking back and forth about what we're going to talk about and how we're going to talk about it. Um, But I guess we could sum it up by saying we're here to talk about what you normally don't talk about. Yes, absolutely. And it's interesting, Mylon, because I think that, you know, when we we initially had these conversations once ago to do this podcast and uh, it didn't it didn't work out at that time. Um, And I'm kind of I was thinking today and I was reflecting and I was like, that was actually a good thing. It was a good thing that we are coming together today to do this because we are in the midst of hunting season Um, and, and some things have transpired since then um that i would love to talk to today perfect the timing's right i agree i agree um because you do a lot so so i know who you are obviously you're you're a podcaster you're working at grant McEwen. you're doing all this cool stuff i'll let you introduce yourself in whichever way you want to introduce yourselves and so our listeners know who you are yeah thank you for that uh uh, my English name is Terry Sungins, and I am from Sadly Cree Nation in Treaty 6 territory. But I am currently uh, residing in a Miskwetiwa Skygun, uh, which is known uh, in English as Edmonton. And I work as the Director of Indigenous Initiatives with McEwen University uh, and have been there for about <clears throat> five years now, I think, almost coming up five years. Uh, so my, my work previously has been uh, within Indigenous education, uh, has been working in leadership with frontline workers in social work and in health. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm also a co-host on Two Crees in a Pod, uh, which uh, my, my, my sister, my best friend, Amber Dion, we created that uh, podcast back at the beginning of COVID uh, as an uh, opportunity, as a digital resource um, to get out to initially just social work students. Um, but it obviously um, has reached far more people and we've been uh, interviewing a number of different folks in all different types of uh, areas. So this is, you know, this is, it's a little bit different for me today because, you know, I'm the one being interviewed, <laughs> so to speak. And I'm usually the one, be, you know, giving the interview. So I'm happy to be here. 
Cool. Yeah, I'm glad to have you. I'm really glad to have you. And yeah, two cruises on a pod. People could like subscribe. I know a lot of our listeners, I think, actually listen to that, like the ones that are from Saskatoon and uh, Alberta side of things. So yeah, Cree podcasts are up and coming. Right. <laughs> totally. <clears throat> yeah, you, you do a bunch of cool stuff like like you're doing a lot. And I know you got me out there and even hired me a few times, which I was really grateful for as a as a struggling Ph.D. student in the past. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we have this like this this history of, of working together and observing each other do do work in terms of academia and working in universities. But then recently, I don't know how it came about, but we had a conversation or no, I remember this is the story. I remember I was sighting in my rifle. And uh, I was just like, you know, it was getting zeroed in and my groupings were OK. And I think it was on Snapchat or Instagram. And you shot me a comment and you're all like, nope, you need to zero that in. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I do technically. And then that led us down this whole conversation of how you have this like super secret background of being a sharpshooter <laughs> and how you were actually competing in terms of like shooting competitions growing up. Yeah. 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 I was telling you to group, to group those a little bit tighter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that, yeah, no, I, I could definitely chat about that a little bit. Um, I, you know, I come from a family of hunters, um, men within my family, uh, you know, my brother, my older brother, my dad, uh, my cousins, uh, my grandfathers who all hunted. And so, you know, growing up as a child, that was something that, I was a part of and that I seen and that I would witness, you know, whether that was um, watching, you know, my family at a very small age, you know, bringing home a moose or a deer and skinning it and gutting it. Um, that was that was life for me. That's how we, we lived off the land. And I know that, you know, my older brother, he tells this story about he's about eight years older than me, my oldest brother, Evan. And uh, he talked about how you know, I, I would cry. I would cry as a toddler to go out hunting with him. And uh, he took me one time and I went out and it was just like in the back, right? Back, back uh, yard in Sad Lake. And uh, he said I'd beg and I, he, I ended up going out with him and then, you know, I, my legs started getting sore. And so then I started crying and I wanted to go home and he had to like carry me back, you know? So even at that age as a toddler, you know, wanting to be out on the land and wanting to hunt um, was something that I wasn't even aware of until, you know, my, my family was sharing stories about me. And so when I was about, I would say between 11 and 12 years old, uh, my oldest brother, again, Evan, was, was target shooting. And my dad started this, uh, it was the Alberta Rifle Shooting Club. Indigenous Alberta Indigenous Rifle Shooting Club um, uh, at that time and he was he had he had my brother and, and my male cousins part of this club and uh, my brother was in the backyard and my dad had set, set up this range back there this target shooting range and, and my brother was always out there you know practicing and one day you know I'd go out there and I'd just watch and I asked you know can I can I try and and he let me and, uh, and so I shot a few times and then we went walking up to the target and my brother was like, oh my God. And he took the target off and he went walking into the house to my dad and he said, look at what Terry shot. And it, it was apparently really good because obviously after that day was when I started to, uh, be involved in the club. And I started practicing, uh, with a 22 rifle at that time. Uh, and doing target shooting. And, you know, uh, I have a steady hand, uh, you know, it, it was something that always came natural to me. Um, and then I started uh, competing uh, in rifle shooting uh, from, I believe, the age of 12, um, even at one point, um, competing in nationals in Canada. Uh, and of course, the Indigenous Alberta Games, uh, the Indigenous Games. And, um, did that up until I think the last time that I competed, I was 28 years old. And that's when I was pregnant with Ella. Um, and I stopped competing at, at that time. But it was it was something that, you know, my father wanted to um, share with us, his children and his family, um, the teachings, but to keep us busy, too, and in, 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 in 
at that time, right? To not get caught up as well in other things. And so, you know, it took up a lot of our time in, in practicing and ensuring that we were um, committed. We had to be committed. And then also the teachings and the stories that came with that, you know, our, my father, and my brother, they have, there's many hunting stories. Crazy. There's some crazy ones that I won't share on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, there usually is like a bunch of crazy hunting stories, right? But yeah, we'll save it for like a, another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of stories that I learned and just the historic stories of like my ancestors and my grandfather, you know, and, and what my father learned as a child. And so in those spaces, I was able to learn a lot of that. And so, um, yeah, I started, I started young and, and I remember, you know, I was my, one of the first times I competed was in this, I was 12 or 13 and it was this competition in St. Paul, Alberta. There was other older women that were competing, but I was the the youngest. And uh and I I ended up competing and and uh having a higher score than the like the top male adults that were competing in that tournament as well, which was my cousin and my brother. Um and so I I I would tease them. I would tease them often about that. Uh, it only happened once. It only happened once on that tournament, but it was something that, you know, I was, uh, that from that point on, I think that there was, um, there was always space that was held for me by my family. Right. And that was really important. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's, that's really cool. And and I was fascinated even when we were messaging and talking about your father and how he supported you and made that space for you to, to not only hunt and shoot, but to, for you to even train. So like to make a sustained project for you to maintain the practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, you know, he's always been really supportive of um, all of us. There was never, I think anything because I was, you know, a girl, there wasn't, it didn't, that didn't matter. Um, we were always, uh, I always felt very much included in the process, um, in, in whether that was competing or in hunting. Right. Yeah. And like background story for this podcast was we literally did have some women listeners, um, and LGBTQT listeners who shot us a message and said, Hey, you know, you should do an episode on women in hunting. Cause there is this dynamic where obviously there's a resurgence of, you know, people making their way back to land-based practices and, and hunting and gathering and things like that. But there's also like conversations that have to happen where we we need to include everybody in those spaces where we need to include and make safe spaces for our people. And I interviewed Philip Brass a few episodes back where he also said, literally, you know, you have to be mindful of who you're going out on the land with or who you're learning hunting practices with. And that was some feedback we did get from women who were wanting to hunt, but literally men and communities saying, oh, women don't hunt or women don't shoot rifles. But that's not the case. That's like far from the truth for for our people. Absolutely. I think that I, I think that even, you know, and, and I shot a, a bull moose about two weeks ago. Um, and at that time, you know, you see on social media, other women, um, female hunters, and it, it's it's a really beautiful thing to see. But the pushback that these women are experiencing um, and even comments made you know, um, to me in regards to, you know, women shouldn't be hunting. Uh, and, and it's, it's interesting. And I've, I've had to reflect on that and, and understand like, where, where is that coming from? And where is that rooted from? Because there's definitely a lot of men in my life, you know, friends, family that, uh, support, support, uh, female hunters. And I think that, you know, there's, there's still a lot of work. And I think, that we have to do within our communities. I think historically some of that stuff may be rooted in some woundedness and obviously um, the history that we have. Uh, you know, there was a comment made where, uh, to me, where traditionally women never hunted. And, you know, my response was, where's your research for that? You know, how, how can you honestly say that women never traditionally hunted? You know, we, 
uh, were here today, you know, we didn't necessarily always have men around us we needed to hunt and and you know my mom even talks about you know snaring rabbits with her mom you know and going out and and hunting for smaller game um and and so i think that um when there's change like this when we start to see shifts like this and change where we have a resurgence or a, a change in roles of this of, of what we are so used to um it, it some people struggle with it and and they struggle with it um in a very defensive way and um it's uncomfortable it's unsettling um but really at the end of the day you know what i could say is like what what bad can come from us hunting you know as as women um as as any anybody hunting if we are doing it in the most meaningful way if we are doing it in the right way if we are ensuring that we are following protocol um right. and you know when i got that bull moose I, yes, I I was the, the I killed the moose. I hunted the moose. Sorry, but I needed men to help me get that moose out of that bush. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I you know, I, we needed help. And again, I think that that goes back to it's not just you know, as women, we're gonna go out and take over the hunting scene. I think that this is again this this we come together collectively. And we can all play a role um, in in hunting and, and supporting each other in some way um, in those spaces. I like how you're saying and highlighting like even the need for community in these practices, right? Because even like just Western white hunting culture, it seems like it's really individualistic. Um, mm -hmm. It's obviously misogynistic, a lot of patriarchy <laughs> in, in, you know, the Western hunting mainstream culture. Um, but everything you're saying is like on point because... It also speaks to me, and obviously, like, I guess we should have the caveat that that we're really speaking to, like, specific family systems and cultural systems. And, and for our listeners out there, you know, that that's something we have to be rooted and grounded in is, is finding our own community-based practices, cultural-based practices that are specific to us. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, like, I have two daughters, right? And if, in my mind, there's no doubt that they're going to learn to shoot. There's no doubt that they're going to learn to hunt, learn to even fight, you know, like do all this stuff yeah. that obviously, like, I, I'm looking forward to teaching them. Um, but again, there, there is like pushback just from community or just assumed um, pushback that, you know, oh, you know, you don't have a son or are these little comments you hear coming from people around our practices and, and, and what we do and and that's sort of what opened me up to wanting to have this conversation too and reach out to you because you're obviously uh, a Cree woman in Heo Square doing this work coming from a family system that's hunted and actually out there and like you said you you got a moose and 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 I wanted to position that really clearly for people who are obviously naysaying but also people who need to hear and feel encouraged to to get out there in a safe and, and secure way. Mm -hmm. You know I think about um my daughters have also come out uh, hunting and uh, they're eight and 11 years old. And uh, last year, um, uh, last November, I got uh, uh, a moose and my 11 year old was with me. And uh, she was so involved in the process of like skinning this moose. And then she even was like trying to start a fire because it was cold in November, trying to start a fire. And she built like this little, like a uh, little teepee structure beside, you know, while we were finishing up, cutting up uh, the moose. And I think about what that space was like for her. And I think about, and, and, and to talk about this as well is that connection that we have to the land and how uh, healing the land can be for us and how it can also regulate us in, in, in different ways. You know, oftentimes if we are struggling, you know, cause my daughter has, um, struggled with, with different things, whether that is us moving to the city and away from our community and um, I can see the shift that happens when she's out on the land as a child and how that that space brings peace to her and brings some kind of connection that um, other people can't do for her. Right. Whether that is the sun, whether it's the trees, whether it is the animals in that space. Um, and it's so important for us to be um, doing this with our children. 
Mm. Um, and, and it's not necessarily, and then understanding, I think as a child, you know, I think about watching my father hunt and my mom would come along, but my mom never was like, my mom never, um, shot the gun or, you know, was, was, uh, cho- wanted to, <laughs> she didn't want to. Um, but I remember watching and I think that, and my sister, my older sister talks about this, um, about that's where we started to learn about respect because we would watch how much respect that our father had for those animals and the, 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 the protocol that was given and the prayers that were given and how we, we took care of that animal and how we took everything and made sure that we were using every part of this animal. Um, and so there's teachings, right? Like in, in hunting as well within our communities is like all of these teachings about how to be a good human being. Um, we can learn and teach our children through, through that. And, and I definitely remember just how important it was to be respectful to animals, how important it was to respect their life, right? And that what an honor it was to for them to give their life for us to live, to, to, to eat from. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, involving our children in our practices and in, in our land-based education and, and hunting is so, so crucial for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and that's something I'm looking forward to as a father is, and, and obviously like, well, my partner, she's Comanche, right? So we have a little bit of different, um, um, I wouldn't say it's a culture clash. I'd say there's just different perspectives on certain things, but the fundamental agreement we have is that we want to get our daughters out on the land and into their traditional territories. And, 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 and that's part of the reason why we're living out in, in rural, rural areas in Treaty 6 territory. Um, so yeah, I'd like to hear you paint that picture. It, it gives me hope also, <laughs> like it, it, it's mm-hmm. giving me the warm fuzzies that I need to hear as a young father. Well, I wouldn't say young father, but as a father who has, <laughs> who has two daughters. Right. And, and that's goals. Like that's goals. And I even think about like ancestral teachings. I think about our cosmology philosophy and our stories too. And, and how just getting out there as a family is, is a, is a constant goal that we're, we're working on maintaining. In, in both landscapes, both in the Southern Plains and in the Northern Plains. And unfortunately, with COVID, we're, we're stuck up here, but we're starting to make plans on on where we're going to go and how we're going to go. Um, but not not just like camping as a family, not just like the weekender type camping that, you know, most settlers do, but, but literally like getting out in the spaces where our ancestors have walked and are still like in, in many cosmological spiritual ways. And, and we're seeking that balance, like we're seeking that balance and ultimately that, that ability to, to do that in very safe, secure and, and natural ways for us, um, not just in the physical sense, but also in like the spiritual, mental and emotional aspects also. I, you know, and there was, there was, there was something that I was processing, um, that I was processing and, and thinking about because I, I'm doing my PhD in social work and, and my research focuses on uh, around ceremony and traditional healing practices and connections to the land. And, um, you know, I lost somebody really close to me at the end of August, um, someone who I would consider, you know, a mentor, a teacher, um, and was really dear to me and and that loss hit me uh really hard and i and i remember you know thinking how am i going to process this you know what what are the things that i need to do to collectively um well to take care of myself but not just you know that self care but that collective care and uh i went and, and at that point was i knew that i needed to go to the land I knew that, you know, it was there that I would be, um, what I would have no choice but to be in tune with all my senses, that I would have to be still, that I would have to be quiet, that I would have to be present and to feel all the things that I need to feel. And I remember uh, going out um, specifically down by the river, um, by my community, and it was it was right after uh, it was the first time I was out right after uh, this loss that I had. And as I was going, you know, I started to feel sick 
I started to feel like uh, my body started to feel like I was nauseous and I was like, oh, okay. And, and recognizing that, you know, this is part of that grief. And, uh, and I was on my quad, I was going along the river and then, you know, I start, I start praying. And as I'm praying, I am thinking about her and I, I start to doubt myself and question myself about um, different things, right? As I'm processing this and asking a lot of different questions in my head. And then all of a sudden, there's this beautiful bald eagle that is just flying right beside me. And I stop and I get out and I offer my tobacco and I say a prayer. And at this point, I'm in tears. And I get back on my quad and I start going. <clears throat> and I start this time, I'm, I'm giving thanks. There's no longer the doubt right and so i'm giving thanks you know for for that blessing and i keep praying and the, and still feeling like but i'm lonely you know this loneliness that i feel and then all of a sudden in front of me is this this beautiful circular rock which we we'll call a grandfather rock and it was a teaching that um Roxanne had shared with me uh, about loss and she had given all of like me, my, my daughters, this rock and had shared a uh, teaching with us months ago about when we lose somebody and, and how we are never truly alone. How, you know, we, we have these rocks to remind us that we are never alone, you know, especially when people are passing. And so there was this big, beautiful circular rock in the path. So I stopped and I picked it up, you know, and at this point I'm smiling you know, cause I know, I know what this, I know the messages that are coming to me. And so, you know, I keep going and then I'm in the happy state, right? Like just thankful, thankful to have those blessings, not feeling like I am alone. And then, you know, having going into this pasture and then if you hear smelling, all I smell is sweetgrass, which was, you know, one of her Cree names and just stopping and staying in that space. And I think about you know, when we think about healing and traditional healing practices, you know, there's, you know, I went through that, that, that path along the river, which took me about, you know, I'd say an hour and a half, and was able to go through the process of grieving, and to come out feeling well. And, you know, and I didn't do that with anybody, another human being, I didn't do that with, you know, I did that with the land, I did that with the animals, I did that with the medicines. And and just, I think that, you know, when I think about what we are doing, and, and the work that we are doing, and working with our children, or working with our communities, and working with healing, the land has so much to offer us. The land has so much to offer us in ways that um, we just have to be so uh, in tuned, right? Um, in tuned, tuned into it in some yeah. way. Yeah. I really like how you highlighted that you felt the need to go to the land and utilize all your senses, right? And and getting tuned in in that way. I remember my late dad always highlighting too, similarly, that that you have to get on the land and, and ground yourself also. And even through dancing, like even dancing out on the land, like, or, or, or like even power dancing or traditional dancing, that it, it sinks you up again. Like you have to resync yourself every once in a while. Yeah, it, totally. Like, I think that that's the one place that will, will definitely help you and assist you in feeling grounded. And regulate, regulate your emotions in some way, right? Like if you're feeling, you're feeling like, I think that, you know, at the beginning of that, that trip, for instance, you know, getting out there and then just feeling like I need to throw up, I don't mm -hmm. feel good, you know, and then having the land by the end of it, feeling great, you know, and how that it, it grounds you, it regulates your emotions. Um, it helps in, uh, different ways that um we see and that we can experience yeah i really like how you're highlighting this very deep connection to the land that we all have access to as indigenous people and and we all have like an inherent right right i hate to say that word in this context but we, we do all have this relationship to the landscape that is ancestral and it's an intimate relationship it can be an intimate relationship with the landscape 
and then even tying it into the hunting practice. And and this is why like I'm really critical of of men who are pushing back against women wanting to hunt or even seeing the need to hunt. Like having colleagues where where men don't hunt in their community or in their family and them wanting to take the initiative to learn and maintain that practice but but not getting the support or encouragement needed. Um, so I guess this question is specifically for them because I know some of them wanted an episode like this to ask the question of of what have you experienced in terms of like pushback from men who are trying to limit access to these spaces or or control and dominate these spaces in unsafe ways? You know, I, I'm fortunate enough that I have um, family and friends in my life that um, are okay with and then that have the space for me to um to want to pursue hunting and and continue hunting um but i do have myself heard comments where um women should not be hunting um women should not be hunting moose you know and i and i think about again it, those are the kind of things that i have to um uh what is you know when I, when i heard it all I, the cree word that i said was kiam mm-hmm. and and really it's it's not that's not for uh, me to carry. That's not for me to worry about. Um, I'd have to stay rooted in the way that I was raised and the space that has been created for me. And so, you know, women who are experiencing this, um, this backlash, so to speak from men, um, is to encourage them to find the people and to focus on the people, uh, that do support them in their, uh, in their journey, for you know going out and to learn i'm still learning like i'm still learning there's i'm always going to be learning i think that you know i i'm I'm not this like big hunter that goes out there i i i I am a good shot (laughs) (laughs) i can shoot a gun good but that's because i I, you know i i (laughs) i practiced and was you know professionally trained for a number of years but you know there's there's things out there that you you can't (laughs) you were still learning. And I was just, you know, I was out with just some girlfriends alone and uh, we went out um, this past weekend and um, I was calling. And then all of a sudden you hear, you know, this moose breaking through the trees coming and, and it was getting dark. And so it was just kind of like, you know, trying to understand. And, and again, like having your senses so keen of like, knowing where it's coming from, how far it is, like it's, and it's, that's tough because you have to like zone in, you have to zone in on that. And, um, you know, and I think that that's the great thing about going out is, is I encourage those is to find your people, find the people who support you, um, and reach out to them in, in going out on the land elders. You know, I remember going out with an elder, um, and he took me to his, his deadly hunting spot and I ended up getting a moose there. Um, but even the teachings that come along with that, um, cause there is, there is, there is people out there who would support it. Absolutely. And then there's going to be the people who don't support it. And then those are the ones that, again, I, I, I think for me, it's, it pushed me to want to do a little bit more research about historically what our uh, women, our indigenous women um, did for hunting. Right. And so when I think about, I have a, I have an assignment that's coming up in November. um, And so I'll be doing some research around that, but it, it pushes me, you know, to, um, find more information and find more research about historically, what did that look like in our communities? You are listening to my conversation with Terry Sungins. We're having an amazing conversation. We're going to give you a short break, though. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Taking you back to my conversation with Terry Sungins. I really like how you're doing the research and you're you're bringing into it like the formal discussion and within your PhD work to answer these questions and give insight to everybody. Because like for me, 
like if we were to have a more like formal conversation, this is like food sovereignty. Like this is like, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, sovereignty in general. This is autonomy, like the land-based practice and hunting. It's so intrinsic in our way of life and our cosmology, even our rites of passage that, that it's something we have to maintain. And it, obviously it's tied to environment. So it's tied to climate change. It's tied to all these, you know, conversations we need to have in general. Um, and so, yeah, it's cool that you're bridging that within your work also. Yeah, there was, there was one question. And, and when that started coming up, I, you know, the pushback with women hunting, um, I asked, I asked somebody, you know, what, why is that? I asked a male, I was like, what, where would that come from? Or why would be, you know, what would be a reason to feel, um, the threat, so to speak? Um, and, uh, he said, you know, it, it, it emasculates a man, you know, it makes them feel like, because it's part of their identity or tradition, not even traditionally, but that's how they may have uh, identified as part of their role, that it was just men that hunted and it was just men. And so to see women taking on that, that role, they feel emas emasculated, right? Like yeah. as if that they, um, that they are, they're losing a piece of themselves in mm -hmm. some sense, right? Which isn't, you know, I think that we need to uh, remind folks that that's, that's not what this is about. You know, mm -hmm. you're not going to be less of a man because I'm shooting a moose. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, yeah. But that's definitely, there's been a lot of reflection on that, that I've been, um, that I've been doing because again, like I, again, like I'm seeing a lot of women, um, shooting moose out there, which is so freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you know, friends that are doing it for the first time and single moms, you know, single moms out there shooting, you know, shooting a, a moose to feed their family, yeah. you know, to feed their kids, mm -hmm. um, and how we need to lift those women up. We need to really support and support the women in our communities who are choosing to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think that's like one of the main takeaways for me too, in general, with this conversation, what I observe is like, that's meat in the freezer. Like that's meat in the freezer. Like right? you're sustaining yeah. a people and it's tied to our traditional diet. It's tied literally to what the moose eats, right? When I, on your podcast, I was, I was blown away with Michael Yellowbird's episode where you sat with him and he was even taking his research to like the level of the gut biome of what our ancestors ate and how it's so tied to place. That's why moose meat's important. That's why moose meat's important for, for our children to be able to eat it. Um, or the wild game in general is important for our children to be able to eat that and, and get connected to that landscape. So yeah, definitely on the same page with you that and with, with that. And and um, yeah, it's really cool to see. Yeah, and moose meat's the best freaking meat out there. So uh, if you haven't had moose meat, you need to try moose meat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I guess also for like our listeners out there from different parts, I mean, there's always, there's always going to be something out there like for you to practice and maintain food sovereignty. Right. Um, like I'm thinking about people in the States that I know my, my colleague down in New Mexico in his little Pueblo, they hunt um, elk in the mountains and, and deer in the mountains. So that's there. And it tastes like juniper. I remember it like specifically tasting like juniper because that's what the animals ate. Right. So, yeah, it's out there. It's just a matter of, like you said, finding the right people who are going to support you in a safe way, in a secure way, and and, and make those land-based access points uh, safe for you. And if you don't feel safe, don't do it. Like, I always tell people that. Like, if you don't feel safe, just don't do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And trust your gut, right? Yeah. Like my dad has always said, trust your instincts. Like, if your body, be mindful of your body. If your body is telling you something, if, you know, you're feeling some type of way, you know, always trust your gut when you're going um, into those spaces, whether that is, you know, and even tying that into going into ceremony, because this can essentially be like a ceremony when you are going in, you know, you're, you're praying, we pray before we go yeah. out to hunt, we smudge our guns, we make sure that we are smudging ourselves, we are praying to ask, you know, this moose to give its life to us. And what a hard prayer that is. 
Like what a difficult prayer that you're asking your relative, another animal being to give its life mm. to feed your family. Um, and so this whole process, right, of, of, of doing that. And then, of course, you know, once you do get, um, if you're successful enough to get your animal, um, the protocol that comes out after uh, with, with the offerings that, that need to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, your father, like, like to see you um, mention him or to hear you mention your father uh, is really cool, too, because he supported you and he obviously still is supporting you, um, got you into target shooting, got you into hunting. And in general, one of the cool things that I I admire in this story you're telling is that how he made a rifle club, (laughs) like he literally made the rifle club for everyone to shoot in. And you said it kept you occupied at very important times in your life where you could have been doing other things. And I know Philip Brass and even Kevin Gonzaga on the previous episode highlighted how our people need safe places to shoot, um, to practice and be safe on the land um Mm -hmm. what do you think needs to happen like i'm I'm really curious about not only the rifle range or the rifle club project but but what do you feel like needs to happen for people to be able to maintain these practices safely i think that you know like again like my father created this this a rifle shooting club within the community of Sad Lake. And, um, and then we started bringing in, obviously there was interest. And so there was other folks from other neighboring um, communities that joined us and did this. Um, and then we started working with other groups um, to find different spaces. Cause we couldn't just, initially we were doing it in our backyard, right? Like the backyard, uh, on the res. Yeah. And I think everybody uh, sites in, in the yeah. backyard and that's probably why we're having this conversation, <laughs> right. Is, is to find the space. Yeah. So we had that space and then we started working, like my dad started building these relationships with like the neighboring town. And then we had, like, we were able to access their rifle range. Um, and so we would bring, you know, the, the folks out to that area and do the target shooting. And so I think that, you know, if we can look at that today, Mm -hmm. because we don't have any really, I haven't seen any of those kind of initiatives happen Mm -hmm. um, within our communities in Treaty 6, like on on this side, Uh, in in a long, long time. And, you know, when we we are looking at camps and we see young girls within our communities, we see like the rites of passage camps with the young girls. You know, we've we've organized ones where we have uh, the young boys going out and they are doing whether they're doing a fast and they are going out hunting. Um, I would love to see. I would love to see because this is something my daughters would love is like a camp where young women were going out hunting. Do you know what I mean? Like where there was and 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 traditional hunters that would come in and share those teachings again, because like I said earlier, there's so many teachings that happen within the whole process of hunting, Mm -hmm. right? There's different things that they are learning. And it's not just about hunting, but all these different natural laws that we have within our culture that they are learning about and mm-hmm. watching play out in front of them. And, you know, I would love to see our communities engage in more um, in, in creating, you know, mm-hmm. uh, space for all. And not even just, it doesn't need to be just men or women or girls or boys, right? Mm-hmm. Like having an open, safe space for people to come together and share these teachings um, with anybody who's wanting to learn. Because I think that that's what it's about. Like my, I know my daughter, Ella, would be out hunting you know she doesn't get scared of that like a a moose could be coming (laughs) could come running through the bush and like most like my heart still pounds like when I hear that right like you you it gets your adrenaline going and my daughter is so calm (laughs) (laughs) like she's she has no fear and so you know she loves being out there and so I think about my children and our communities um it's, you know, I would love to see our, our communities do that as creating these, these spaces, these hunting camps, and not just for boys, yeah. for girls too. Yeah. And, and I know there's a lot of cool land-based programs out there and teachers doing amazing land-based work. 
Uh, I know you even had Kevin Lewis on your podcast with uh, Gani Asik and his his program up there and his camp that's doing a lot of work constantly. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, like for me, I think I'm I'm attracted to like the more technical aspects of of shooting and and things like that. And again, just having the caveat again for our listeners that you know things may look differently in your community. You know, your land based practice and and who you're talking to and even the animals you're going to be hunting and when you're hunting them, there's going to be very like specific considerations you're going to have based off your tribe, your people, and your community and the nations you're coming from. Um, but, you know, the female female spaces, I think, are something really important, too, in terms of how we're moving forward collectively in the future. And even, like, LGBTQT folks, like, I like I notice a lot of people, like some of my colleagues who uh, who I have are, are into the land-based practice stuff and into um, hunting and, and doing what they want to do out there, and them, too, <laughs> even advocating and, and, and saying that, hey, we need safe spaces to not only maintain the practice and learn, but even just to, like, train and get out there and keep, you know, doing the practice, <laughs> like literally <laughs> getting the wisdom time and time again. I think that's so important is, is that we are creating that space, that we always create spaces for opportunity. If we really want to do this work within our communities and, and you know, build up our youth, um, it's about creating opportunities for yeah. everyone. Yeah, totally. And then like when it boils down to like when we're just talking about hunting for me it, it it ties into food sovereignty like like me with my logical mind it's it's literally meat in the freezer for our people and and that's something that keeps coming up for me in terms of our hunting practice is it's literally sustainability like it's literally to sustain ourselves so anyone who wants to you know get into those projects to feed people like i'm all for that like whether it's a garden, mm -hmm. whether it's hunting, whether it's even I know berry people like Cree people in particular, we tend to make fun of berry pickers, but but it's real. Like we need berries, you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? We do. <laughs> like it's a very real practice. Get out there and pick if that's what you want to do. Like feeding the people, that's like the most admirable, one of the most admirable things we could do in this day and age where capitalism and colonialism is ongoing to feed people out of the goodness of your heart, like that speaks to me. So any project that mm -hmm. fosters that is like, yeah, um, I support that. And all of these things, right, that, that whether that's the berries or the moose meat or the moose nose, you know, these are also very um, sacred foods that we need for our ceremonies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so anytime we get a moose, you know, I think I have like four requests coming in for, you know, who can I get the nose, right? Like, they, and they come in quick. And so we know that these are items that are needed within our own traditional ceremonies um, and the importance of that. So like how we are even gathering them, how we are hunting, how we we are carrying ourselves when we are hunting we shouldn't be out drinking and hunting you know we shouldn't be carrying ourselves in a bad way when we are doing this because part of that meat will be going into ceremony mm -hmm. and so that's you know again like there's just so many teachings that can be shared um in regards to hunting and it, it was interesting because last time when we went out when um i got when i two weeks ago when i got the moose and and me and my sister um my adopted sister we were um you know at the end of it we got it the sunday sunday morning and weird we went I think we started hunting or Saturday morning. I don't even remember. Um, but we had unintentionally fasted, right? Like we went after the, like we got the moose loaded up and everything. We're like, what, when did we last eat? Like when did we last actually have something to eat? And it was like that Saturday morning. Cause then when we got back, we went out hunting right away. And then we got home late, slept woke up, got our gear on and we're out the door hunting again. Right. And so it was, um, you know, and it was interesting because again, like, you know, and those are questions that I have traditionally that are, did our people hunt like fast as well for, for their, uh, for their animals, for their food, you know, as, as part of that, that ceremonial process. So Mm -hmm. I have lots of questions. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> it, it's true. Like how you're 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 coming to those awarenesses when you're out there because that's what happens to me all the time. Like when when I'm out there doing stuff or doing my cultural revitalization projects, you can, you you just start to think about our ancestors or our family in the past who were doing these things and what was it, what were they thinking about? How it was it? How was it for them? You know what I mean? Like especially when you're out there, like retracing their footsteps in, in many ways because they did it without the coffee or they did it without the truck yeah. and the vehicle. Yeah. And like, obviously the, I always am blown away by realizing how efficient our people were 
at our land based practices and and obviously how strong the community was because those are those are some things we we notice we're lacking like even in the field of social work we know our communities are struggling but then at the same time it's like I look back and I think back about how strong we must have been to maintain these practices practices collectively for everyone to have berries for everyone to have sweet grass for everyone to have sage for the season for everyone to have meat for the season it was like a very efficient way of living our lives and and those those awareness has come with me too like man our people had to do this <laughs> mm-hmm. like they had to do this like 200 300 years ago yeah and it's hard work yeah it's hard work as a and and it's like as a family like that's what's crazy about it. it's like they were all out here like people were are all our people were out here just living life this way yeah yeah Amazing stuff. I really like what you're doing and, and, and what you're working on. I know you're doing your PhD now, so you're welcome to the PhD life. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I'm wishing the best for you with that. Thank you. Yeah. And well, I guess like in closing, like what, what would you recommend women or LGBTQT folks or even just young hunters um, who want to get into hunting or want to get into a land based practice? Like what's what's your little step by step guide for them in terms of just wanting to get out there in a safe way? I think it would be, and, and again, like, I think it would be finding, finding a connection within community, um, whether that is with, um, you know, a family, a, a family of hunters, um, that they feel comfortable with, um, having those conversations, you know, I'm always up to talk about hunting. So if anybody ever wanted to reach out to me, um, I definitely, you know, would be open to those conversations. Um, but I think that, you know, finding your connections within your community and, um, and then also to our folks who work within our community in building some of these programming is to create opportunities uh, for uh, land-based education uh, for our youth and for our animal, our adults as well, our animals. I was going to say our animals, <laughs> our adults. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, finding a safe space, obviously we talked about trusting your gut, you know, that you are going out with the right folks, um, that we, when we are hunting, we're not, hunting for sport it's not uh it's not something that we are doing uh to feed our ego or Mm -hmm. to have the biggest trophy or the biggest buck or what have you right i think that you know being mindful of those conversations or the way that people are talking about hunting um can you know uh you can get some awareness from that, but definitely connecting, you know, there's, there's, we have many hunters in our communities. We do. um, And I think that uh, sometimes we have fears of reaching out, you know, to those men within our communities because we may be turned down, Um, but there's going to be somebody out there. There is going to be somebody out there that is going to be willing to want to teach you and share uh, the teachings, share the stories and and potentially taking you out there. You know, I love taking people out. Um, You know, I've been going out with a lot of women lately Mm -hmm. and uh, women who haven't been out before, you know, and really pushing, especially my adopted sisters, you know, one of them doesn't like being out and I'm like, you need to come out. And, you know, after this weekend, she's like, wow, she's like, it's so refreshing you know, it's so healing to be out here. Um, and so, you know, we, we never know until we go out and we experience it ourselves. And so encouraging one another and, and um, taking that time, taking that time to be out there is really important. Awesome. Yeah, I like it. I like it all. I like all what you're saying. And it's valuable information for everybody out there. Because again, we're in a time where people want to reconnect where there is a resurgence of land based practice around hunting. And there's a growing uh, land based education um, projects in our communities all across the board, it seems. But yeah, I really like to have these fundamental conversations that ensure quality. Right. Like I feel like I, I like to strive for quality in everything that I do. And mm-hmm. and I think that's like a really important aspect is that, you know, there's there's basically there's quality control. <laughs> like we, we like there's quality control to what we do. It's it's not about quantity. It's not about like rushing the stuff. It's actually about maintaining the practice and being connected and doing things in a good way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that um, I'll, I'll end off with is that, you know, part of um when I got the moose two weeks ago was we were documenting uh, the process. 
and we were documenting. Um, so typically you're not out there, you know, when you're out there, you, you, you have to be so quiet, right? Like if you are calling in the moose, um, that you don't, you're not on your phone or, you know, you're, you, again, you're, you're zoning into your senses. Mm-hmm. Um, but this time around, I wanted to, um, I had asked, you know, my, my sisters to, um, document, take pictures. You know, if we see a moose bed, take a picture of the moose bed. So people know what a moose bed looks like. You know, when we see, you know, there was like the, the moose tracks, take a, picture of the moose track. So we have all these images and videos that we collected that weekend. Um, and that, that was for a purpose, uh, to create a digital story, to create some type of something that we can share with others, uh, other women, other people, anybody in general. And I think that the other part of that is that, you know, it, when we talk about men, more specifically being uncomfortable with female hunters is that when things become more visible, um, when there is, uh, when they start to see it more, um, it, they may become educated on, on understanding why we are doing what we are doing or why we are choosing to hunt. Um, but once it's more visible, you know, it, they, they may feel unsettled, but then that wears off that wears off and it becomes the norm. You know, my hope is that down, you know, when my, my daughters are a little bit older, it's just normal for women to go hunt, you know, because it's, it's out there and it is, it is part of who we are. It's part of who we are. And so, you know, we are going to be creating, um, just like a little kind of, uh, digital story just to share that will help, you know, what that process was like and to share some of those teachings, um, of hunting and, and being out on the land. So. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. I like it. I like it. So if someone wants to find you or reach out to you, how do they get a hold of you? Um, they can, um, I am working with McEwen university. So the website, um, is McEwen.ca, M A C E W A N dot C A. Um, my work email is Cardinal t at mcewen.ca um, so they can definitely find my contact information on our McEwen website which is um i i believe that they have my contact information under kehoe watson indigenous center um so yeah they can reach me through email um yeah it's probably the best way I'm on Facebook too. So if anybody ever wants to reach out on Facebook, I always find that people are more easier to get a hold of on Facebook. I don't know if you find <laughs> that be the same way, but I, I get a response better on Facebook than I do on, uh, than on, uh, email. But yesterday Facebook was shut down. So there was no, <laughs> I had no yeah. choice but to use email. <laughs> <laughs> true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there was a Facebook outage. So I guess that dates when we recorded this podcast because I think it's a memorable day for Indian country. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to um, our listeners getting a lot out of this episode because, yeah, this was based off a direct request from, you know, some colleagues up in northern Saskatchewan in the United States and even in the western parts of Canada saying, I want to get out there and hunt and, and how do I do it? So we kind of just launched like these mini series the last few episodes. So, so cool. yeah, excited to see the response and get them out there. So awesome. I'm glad. And thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the um, the opportunity to talk about that. It's not something that I typically talk about. And, and yeah, like it's not, I usually focus on different topics. So, you know, this is definitely something that is close to my heart. And, you know, I love sharing anything that, uh, that has a connection back to my family and um, the teachings that were shared for me. Thanks. Thanks for sitting down with us and having this conversation. And again, you're doing amazing work and, and keep doing it and we'll stay in touch. Thank you.